So a lot of us don't know how to listen, and therefore a lot of us don't feel like we have been listened to, sometimes ever. Welcome to the Bro Novo Podcast, the podcast that models healthy communication for men, empowering them to start the journey of self-work. Now here's your host, Thomas Pierce. Welcome, everybody. My guest this week is Seven Jacobs. He's a young social entrepreneur, speaker, and advocate for mental health. He has his own startup. He's also the host of a mental health podcast for young leaders called Lost in Searching. He's helped build startups in music, tech, and consulting, and is in the process of becoming a certified coach. Seven and I had a really nice conversation. Check him out at Instagram at seven.jacobs, and I really hope you enjoy the conversation. I sure did. Thank you, Seven, for being on the show. My ask this week, folks, is to get this thing out on your social media, whatever it is, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok for you youngsters. You get to be a hipster right now. <laughs> I'm in this thing for the long haul. One day, this is going to be a massive podcast, and you will be someone who is in on it early, and you can help the show grow. So that's my ask. Please share this episode out and enjoy the show. All right, and we're live. Good afternoon, Seven. How are we doing, man? I am great today, man. Thank you so much for having me, Thomas. Yeah, for sure. How is it How is it over there in uh, in London this time of the year? Well, uh, this has been a strange summer. Climate change and all, I think, has affected us uh, a lot this year. We've had a heat wave, and then it goes into being all weird and super cold, and then back to another heat wave. And so today, it's just a normal, very gray British London day. Um, but for me, it's for me, it's always a little strange because you can hear my accent; it's a little bit weird. I was born in Los Angeles, so I've been here in London for about a decade but was born in Los Angeles and grew up there for a few years. And so to me, it's always, and I've lived in other places in the world as well. So for me, it's always been a case where the weather just kind of is what it is. And um, the people are always different, but it is what it is. And it's always like, I just take it as it comes. So um, it's a little bit weird even talking about that for me. I'm like, oh, things just kind of are, you know. Um, mm. But overall, it's it's been an interesting time for me. I'm in a period right now where... I'm very reflective around the people around me, the kind of things I'm doing, hence why I'm jumping on on shows like this, trying to pass on some of my experiences and also talking a lot to other people as well as reflecting a lot around my own health, balance in my own life, things like burnout, for example. So hopefully some of these things come out today. So yeah, I'm really excited, man. Thanks for having me. For sure. So that's cool. That's a good for you, man, to use... A podcasting platform as a way as like a self-reflection tool and you know i i can sense like an altruistic motivation too kind of trying to help people and, and share some lived experiences but yeah it's good that's good man maybe i'll i'll keep that in my back pocket nice <laughs> nice going on other shows cool so i'm sensing a bit of the inter or in, intra-cultural identity going on so mm -hmm. is it one of those where you know if you go go to the u.s you know, people might not see you as, you know, fully American, air quotes, whatever that means, and vice versa in the UK. Sure. Is that something you deal with? Um, you know what? It's it's funny. I feel like I have never really fit in anywhere. Um I and I guess to give you a little bit of, of my background, yeah, I was born in LA, but I moved to uh the UK about a decade ago um with family because we didn't have much of a life left for us in the u.s unfortunately and um it was a it was a a strange thing for me because i've always struggled with identity so i got here and i was kind of like cool but i still don't know who i am and then a, a decade later who i am it's become a case where who i am is very removed from things like where I'm from, because I've always been the odd one out. Well, regardless of where I am, I've always been the odd. When I was a child, I was the odd one out because of my personality, or because I was a bit more mature because of experiences I had as a child. Now I'm the odd one out because of my career path, because again, kind of because of the maturity, because of the places I've been or the things that I believe I've always kind of been the odd one out. So I don't know. I don't really get all that all that fussed around mm -hmm. not fitting in and and, and shit like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So what is your, your career path these days? How do you yeah. 
how do you keep yourself busy and, and fill sure. the coffers? Right. So I am a young social entrepreneur. Um, I've been kind of involved in entrepreneurship for a few years now, four, four or so years. And when I talk about the career, I really do mean entrepreneurship as a career. So, um, working on businesses as opposed to just in businesses, helping people set them up or setting up businesses of my own. Um, and putting them into places so that they operate and then moving on or doing other things or working for other people to help them do that in their business. And that pretty much is the career path at the moment. I also have a podcast on the side, which I kind of do for funsies um, called Lost and Searching, which explores the mental health of young leaders like myself or, well, I speak to leaders of, of all, of all kinds and backgrounds and ages. Um, but kind of to pass on the message to younger leaders like myself. So a lot of what I do really is passion driven. It's very independent kind of me doing things on my own. So that has issues, uh, within and of itself. But overall, really all of it is exploring me, who I am passions I have, what I love, things I do. Um, so some of those areas that I've worked with before, consulting and, and market research, um, music, I'm helping build a music business right now, a tech business within the fashion industry, an education business within entrepreneurship. So there's a lot of different things I've, I've worked on or am currently a part of, as well as kind of getting into the men mental health space and podcasting space a little bit more myself. So always doing, always doing a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, and I think one of the things I'd love to probably explore with you today is kind of the reasons why, right? What I love a lot about your, your, your show or the premise of your show and why I wanted to jump on with you here today is because for me, the idea of speaking to, I guess it, it particularly speaking to, uh, young men, um, but really to anyone about their mental health and why we currently do the things we do is incredibly important to me. I think a lot of what I do now stemmed from actually really unhealthy places um, within my mental health and my kind of childhood experiences that I'm sure we'll get more into in a little bit. And so that's led to a life that I now love, but only with a lot of self-reflection, transformation and things like that, so that it just wasn't just the product of a really unhealthy lifestyle um, and unhealthy self-beliefs. So yeah, man, there's, there, there's obviously a lot to unpack there, but that's, that's kind of the premise. Nice. Okay. So one, one question on the entrepreneurship mm. would be around the feasibility or mm. I guess the financial feasibility of that, because I think that could be a big roadblocker for a lot of people. Sure. You know, giving up the, the stable salary, mm. you know, diving into the unknown. Yeah. So for you and the start of that, did you follow a, a blueprint for a number of years to save to be able to do that? Or, or how did it, how was it feasible for you? And then for somebody who is afraid to take that jump, what would you recommend to them? Sure. Well, I think there's a couple of things here. One is that I, I feel like I'm very privileged in a sense that because I started young, uh, I didn't have to worry about super scary financial implications of it. That being said, because my family's always been poor and struggling in various different ways, or I should say broke and struggling in various different ways, that it was still, it was still a bit of a roadblock. It creates a lot of stress. It creates a lot of worry. Once in a while, creates some panic. The, the advice I think I'd, I'd give to anyone kind of regardless of your age, but especially if you're not in a place where, like I was, where you had a bit more space to do that is what all of my network, including myself have all done is it's been about deciding firstly to overcome the mental or how you're going to overcome the mental barrier, the, the mental health roadblock of I'm really stressed. I'm really concerned. I'm worried. I'm worried about almost the safety net. I think a lot of that stems from, from self-limiting beliefs that we have about ourselves. And I understand those very well. I've had name a self-limiting belief and I've had it. I mean, the story I tend to tell is that growing up, my whole paradigm was that I'm not good enough that I'm not worth anything, that I don't matter. That was my, that was what I believed about myself. And it was so deeply ingrained. I couldn't, I thought that, that was what I was, not just what I thought is what I was it became me, which is really scary when you put it out like that. But that, because I had those beliefs, 
taking risks was almost like it wasn't possible to take a risk. Does that make any sense? It's almost like if you so mm-hmm. deeply believe that something is the way it is, then there's nothing else it could be. You couldn't be an entrepreneur which requires taking risks or do anything that requires taking risks if you so deeply believe that you are whatever it is that's keeping you from taking those risks. If I am the job or I am the person that is afraid of losing a job or I am the someone who's always had this career or I am the person who can't afford to take these risks – then you can never afford to take those risks and you will always believe that's the case. So that's the number one is the self-limiting belief. Physically and practically speaking though, what me and a lot of my network have have uh, talked about and described in the past is like, it feels really nice to have that stable income. And, and this maybe is a bit more relevant again for younger people actually. It feels really nice to have that more stable kind of income, that more stable place to come from. And it can get a bit more worrying when you don't have that anymore. If it's a case where it's physically impossible to not have that anymore, you've got to put in extra work to work on your dreams around that, right? I, I, some of the, the people I respect the most are the people that are able to hold down two jobs while they work on a, on a side hustle or something like that, because it takes, it, it, it takes effort. The idea being that you are setting yourself up for the long term. So sometimes I will take short term hits for long term gains, right? I will take a short term not making any money for long term share shares in a business or something like that to that, that I know haven't even affected me yet because it still hasn't been enough time, but it will come back eventually, right? I'm setting myself up for long term success and don't give yourself a reason to feel worse, right? So don't. For me, it's a case mm. of I didn't, for example, I, I uh, didn't quit my old job until I knew I could do something else, until I knew I was ready. But the as and I was working incredibly hard to put myself in that position when I was ready. This was my work hours are still about sixty hours a week, you know. Um, and a lot of a lot of people are uh, uh, entrepreneurs will be like, nah, seventy, eighty, you know, they'll keep going. I know what my limit's mm-hmm. about 60 before I start shutting down. But you know what I mean? It's like you must do what is right for you. I, you know what? I think that'd be my biggest piece of advice is you must do what is right for you. Um, there will be time. There'll be a, there's lots of advice out there. I can give you my personal experiences, but you will require a different balance. You will have different needs. You will have different people in your life to support. Um, and if you totally ignore those specific contextual details, you're going to do something that, that shoots yourself in the foot because you won't be thinking about your unique context. You won't be thinking about your needs. You won't be thinking about how different you are, how your experiences play into what you can and can't yet do. You know, Think about how different you are and start to tweak your life around that. I don't think there's any other way to do that there's no one size fits all yeah exactly there's no there's no blanket solution for everybody for sure well that's helpful man i think what i kind of heard from that was that there is a necessary risk tolerance at some point yeah if somebody wants to go out on their own and maybe the less sexy side of it that people won't tell is that it it's hard work and Mm. you have to work your ass off if you have a dream to go get it which i mean Mm. i guess that that should be obvious, but I think our I don't know our our narrative culturally, at least here in the U.S., I feel like is kind of mm. it's evolving, and I think the like the work first mentality is is kind of being challenged a little bit. It's being a little bit trying to put into balance and put into perspective yeah. of you know the whole like work to live, not live to work kind of thing. Mm. But the maybe the the negative side of that is that these more frank conversations about, yeah, if you want to achieve financial freedom or you want to have your own successful business that breaks you out of the rat race, you're going to have to put in 80 hour weeks for 10 years, maybe. You know what? I think we're, we're, uh, and I think this is especially true of like Gen Zers and millennials. So like young, young and younger people is where we are at a, at a period in time when there is so much more opportunity that 
not necessarily can be taken, but that can be made, right? So you can take opportunity, but you can make it as well because of on like online spaces, evolving technologies, etc. It is so much easier to create an opportunity for yourself to do something that, of course, we're talking a lot more about working smart as opposed to working hard. But I, I'm starting to have a problem as someone who specializes in entrepreneurship and entrepreneurialism, not just I'm not in an industry and an entrepreneur in that industry. I'm an entrepreneur first and work in various industries. So entrepreneurship as a concept is really important to me. And we're seeing a lot of online businesses saying, use my blueprint to become a business, to, to become an entrepreneur who makes X amount of money. And I've got a few problems with that. Number one, being an entrepreneur isn't about the money. Yes, if you do do well, there's a lot of potential to make a lot more money than, you know, doing your average nine to five. Sure. But that isn't the reason you get into it. You should be getting into being an entrepreneur because you see a need to do something really interesting and want to provide that um, service, that support, that innovation, that technological innovation, invention even, if that's what your thing is. You should want to provide that and find that interesting. I see entrepreneurship like a puzzle, especially social entrepreneurship, which is my thing, right? Finding a way of making the world a better place through that business. That's like putting together a puzzle. That excites me. If you're not in it for that kind of thing, right? If you're only in it to follow a blueprint, that that's just a job where you work for yourself. That's not being an entrepreneur. Um, and and what that inevitably means is that regardless of how smart you work, you will still have to work incredibly hard, which I feel like is, and this is the second thing I want to bring up based on what you said is like, because of all this opportunity going around. I mean, we can see it so easily because of social media. I feel like we're very pushed to act like we're doing better than we are, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I worry that I do it without even realizing it. So right now, yes, I'm a young social entrepreneur, but I still uh, work part-time to help support that. Um, like I said, I'm very priv- privileged because I'm younger. I'm currently supporting my family, but that means my financial expenses are lower at the moment, things like that. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I have to work my ass off. Sometimes it doesn't feel like I'm achieving much of anything. That becomes uh, an impact on my mental health. Um, and there's, there's not loads of finances in the bank, but it doesn't really matter because I know, like I can see where the long term benefit is and that exists right. and that's factual, but it's not glamorous. Does that make sense? So you, again, you must know what's right for yourself and do what you love within the balance that is right for you as an individual. Otherwise you're going to be going down all these rabbit holes that just serve to make your life worse. And that, and, and the reason I think that's so important is because I'm seeing that so much with both, uh, newer as well as more established or successful entrepreneurs is like, I'm doing all this work, but I still feel like crap. My mental health is still like this. And said, that's why I started my podcast, my podcast lost in searching specifically because I was tired of my peers feeling the way that I've always felt, but for different reasons, purely because of their work, they felt, damn, I'm not good enough. I'm not achieving fast enough, or I have achieved, but I still feel like shit or whatever. And it's kind of like, this, this is not, this is not the right balance for you. If that's the case, you know, something in your life, whether it's your habits or your, your beliefs about yourself, something needs to shift. Um, so let's have a conversation about that to see, to see how, how you feel about that and, and why you might feel the way as you feel, you know? Um, yeah, man. Yeah, nice one. Yeah. So another thing you said earlier that I want to revisit is the difference between being poor and being broke. Yeah. To put this way, that being, you know, poverty is a state of being or a a more permanent or a more chronic Mm. kind of identity. Mm. But being broke is a current state. And being broke is something that can be fixed and can be climbed out of and systemically Mm. broken down. Yeah. You know, I think, I think about it on a, an even simpler level than that. I think where, um, being broke is very, like, is very specific to how much money do I have in the bank? 
right? Whereas poor is um, applies to lots of different contexts, right? So I can be physically in financial poverty, sure, but I can also have poor mindsets. We use the word poor in exchange for the word bad in our vocabulary all the time, right? Poor performance at school. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Removing, it, I think it just... Word play is really important to me. It, it helps remove ourselves from situations where we kind of unconsciously reinforce our own negative belief without, without realizing it. I grew up very poor in all the senses, right? My mindset was horrible. My influences, um, from family and life in general, uh, made me believe that there wasn't much out there, that I couldn't achieve very much, do very much, that life was horrible and unfair. I was a super cynical, as a, especially as a child, I was super cynical, um, as well as being financially poor. Now I would say, um, you know, if something goes wrong or whatever, that, that I would be broke, but I wouldn't be poor because I'm so confident in having a much better mindset. But that took an insane amount of work. And because of my mental health, it still runs itself back sometimes. And I've got to rest and I go through periods of depression or whatever, do you, do you know? So it's like mm -hmm. just the simple shift of seeing myself in a different light shifted how much I was able to do even in short spaces of time is it's, it's not just the thing is it's not just about doing it's about being which version of something something i love talking about is we have different versions of ourselves you have different i i have different sevens within me you've got different thomases within you right so with me i've got the eight-year-old me who is experiencing homelessness loss of family and lots of really negative kind of mindset related influences all at the age of eight. And so I've got that version of me that is small, that is scared, that is still a child because I'm so young, mm -hmm. who is feeling all those ways, who's got all those beliefs. I've got that version of me that still exists in my brain and will probably always exist in my brain. But how often do I listen to that? Or how often do I give energy or give weight to the things that that version of me is saying? Do I let that version of me take over and be the me that comes out into the world, right? But then I've also got, for example, my wiser self. So my wiser self is me in 10 or 20 years time who knows all the things that I'm going through right now and knows, well, we're still here in 10 or 20 years. Things are okay. As stressful as they get, as strange as they get, as difficult as it might be for you to know where you're going, because obviously the future is not guaranteed, but the me in 10 or 20 years knows that I'm still here. So what was there to worry about? What was there to stress about? I absolutely love that concept because it helps us understand that we'll, we'll have times when we don't feel so great, when things get difficult, where we feel really lost. But actually through the right actions, you know, things, things can improve a lot. Um, or that these some of these things are temporary. So whether it's the mindset of being poor or the physicality of being broke, to use your examples, you know, even that that is might be temporary, or it might be uh, uh, currently factually true, but not uh, but not worth worrying about because we've given it more weight. So if right now I'm broke, but I'm getting paid tomorrow. Does it really matter that I'm broke right this second? Do you know what I mean? So, or so, something like that, you know, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. perspective can change as well, depending on which version of yourself you're listening to. So yeah, man, it's just really important to me that especially in, in times when it feels like there's so much pressure coming in from so many different directions, that we're really real with ourselves about what is and what is just something that we've perceived to be a certain way, you know? 100%. I like the. Yeah, the idea of perspective and how our current state can feel so dramatic, because it is. I mean, you know, when we are, are in, whether it's financial, emotional, these kinds of distress, it feels like everything, right? Because that's mm. how we perceive, you know, our minds are, you know, we see what's right in front of us. And I think our minds see what's right in front of us kind of metaphorically too. Yeah. But thinking about the future, and th this is the one I do. It's kind of dramatic too, but I'll, if I'm upset about something or worried about something, I'll think about, am I going to remember this on my deathbed? Mm. I, the agree. No, I, I could completely. Then, 
fuck it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's, what's the fucking point of that, right? It's like life is far too short to be giving a shit about so many things that don't actually matter. Mm -hmm. But then, it, of course, it begs the question, what actually matters? So, like, using your example mm -hmm. just now, what what kinds of things do you feel like are worth remembering on your deathbed and which ones aren't, right? What kinds of things do you think are worth stressing about or worrying about and which ones would you do you in your own personal life anyway, try to let go of instead? For sure. I guess one caveat to that is things that are not important to me may still matter to other people. Sure. So for example, relationships, mm. let's say I have a romantic relationship or a friendship and I do something that I perceive to be not a big deal but it still hurts the other person, sure. then I would say for me, change the calculus of, okay, it matters. You know, yes. like yeah. it does matter on my deathbed, mm. the people I've hurt or mm -hmm. relationships mm. that I didn't put enough effort into. Like, I think that's an important caveat around, Oh yeah. You know, a hundred the, the selfish nature of the mind. And if, if we strictly think, will it matter to me in my deathbed? Then we can kind of overlook potentially mm. hurting other people. Sure. But then I guess that that's, I guess in a way that's part of the question. I think the, the better question mm -hmm. is what is worth worrying about on your deathbed? And yeah, I would, for sure. You know, yeah. the, the way, the way you've impacted others, I do think is one of them. Have I left mm. love, light, enjoyment, uh, joy, I should say, positive experiences, learning and interesting conversation, whatever it is that's important to you. Have I left those things in the world? And if the answer is no, or the answer currently is no, I wouldn't have left enough, then maybe you need to shift what you're doing day to day or week to week or whatever, right? For sure. Whereas if you've left too much negativity in the world, you know, have I left enough joy? No, I've, I've actually left negativity instead. Oh, shit. Okay. Well, now I need to do something differently. It's a part of the reflection <laughs> process, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For me, I would say inspiration. Mm. I want to I wanna inspire people to be authentic and be themselves. Mm. Be vulnerable, take chances, not live behind a mask their whole lives and not wonder, you know, who's the person I could have grown into if I let myself. Mm. That's a big one for me. And yeah. I think just being silly, man, being, yeah, you know, I think as, as people, some people, it seems like never lose that, that silly nature, never, never lose that, you know, happy childlike version of themselves. But it mm. seems like with aging and responsibilities, most people kind of shed that. So that's another one that I would like to to leave behind is mm. encouraging people to just to laugh and love and be a little yeah. a little lighter and not not take themselves so seriously. Yeah. Do you know what I I really relate to that one? I think mainly because I've spent a lot of my life taking myself very seriously, but always wishing I was the kind of person that you just described, right? In 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 my life, especially growing up, I faced a good number of hardships that led to a lot of anxiety, a lot of really tense, like tenseness. I don't know if that's even a word, but um, it just mm -hmm. meant that there's a whole version of me that I, I feel like a lot of people don't see. People uh, in my close personal life don't see what I'm like at work. People at work don't realize what I'm like in my personal life. And, and sometimes those people don't know what I'm like at all. None of them anywhere. Um, it, it's, it's just because I'm still, I'm still fairly early in this journey, relatively speaking, it's, it's a case of like, I know I've taken myself far too seriously. Now, what the fuck do I do about that? Because, mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's, it's so deeply rooted. It's one of those things that's really, really deeply rooted. How have you, so here's a question for you. How have you noticed that within yourself and and tried to to make that change or or is it a case where you already do it and if so what's what's that feel like because i'd love to know more about like what is it like to just be this you know bubble of energy or be a bubbly person and and how does that how does that work how do we make that transformation because that's one of the things i struggle with like crazy man yeah great question i think a lot of it is innate for for me Luckily, I just kind of had that attitude. And I think a lot of it goes back to a stable childhood, you know, in, in the context of this is kind of what you mentioned and how you had a lot of mm. stressors growing up. I kind of had the opposite uh, in, in many ways, which I'm very grateful for and, and blessed with. Something, something more concrete as far as how other people can foster that, I would say surround oneself by light people, you know, mm. people who just have that lightness about them and, and, and laugh at life and enjoy what they're doing and don't take it too seriously. I've always found that 
my peer group really influences me very strongly. So that, that would be one. And then I would say, I mean, there are things like laughing yoga. Have you ever heard of that? I haven't. It's a, yeah, it's like intentionally laughing and you know, there are, it's, it's, it's the idea that forcing oneself to smile and forcing oneself to laugh that eventually translates and, and kind of seeps in. Mm, you know, if you think about like sense, genuine actually. laughter coming from the inside out, you, yeah. you can externally laugh and eventually it, it gets in. <laughs> okay. That's really interesting. Yeah. Oh, that makes so much sense to me, actually. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, I would say for me, the peer group is a massive one and... I think just doing things that are are silly and fun. So, for example, like my girlfriend and I, a couple of weekends ago, we went to a trampoline park that had a dodgeball course in the trampoline park. Oh, and I love that. We were that. playing dodgeball on trampolines with a bunch of 10-year-olds. I've done that. You know what? I, I, it sounds so strange because it is mostly children at these places, but I did that like a couple months ago as well. And I was like, this is the most fun thing I've ever I've done in a long time. Um, yeah, I felt so fun. real weird and out of place, but throwing dodgeballs at, at people over the heads yeah. of like eight-year-olds. But it was very – but but you know what? Maybe Maybe that's a really simple – like like lessons to take away where however you feel and like this is a piece of advice i was given recently and maybe this is relevant um so right now i'm i'm in a, a state like a we're at like particularly time of recording i'm feeling a little bit burned out right i've been because i've been doing so much especially this year 2021 but doing so much stuff all the time i'm in a place where i'm feeling a little bit burned out and someone said to me recently take a vacation and in doing so treat yourself like a guest right so ask yourself what do you need to like what do i need today in the way you'd ask a guest do they need you know would they like an extra slice of dessert or whatever i don't know but you know what i mean mm-hmm. treat yourself with love with respect treat yourself pamper yourself the idea of pampering yourself kind of you know treat yourself like someone else that you really really want to take care of and maybe in in a really similar way if if we want to learn to laugh more to love more treat yourself like someone else that you want to make laugh treat yourself like someone else that you want to relax treat yourself like someone else who you want to feel joy and light you know what i mean and that way it's really easy to start thinking of practical things i can do do i go get a massage do i just rest and do nothing except read you know fantasy fiction books all day in bed do i do you know what i mean um instead of being Mm -hmm. super duper hard on yourself see I, i don't know how how much you feel this way but because of my life and chosen career because of the balance of always doing work and it not necessarily always paying off there's always more it feels like i can be doing but that does build up even if i dealt with the the things like stress and pressure really well it doesn't change the fact that it doesn't leave much room for rest so resting can feel really hard because then worries or stress or pressure will start to creep in when you don't do stuff so as a little bit for me is a little bit of a of a case of learning to rest right i have to almost relearn what it means to take time off i have to relearn what it means to rest to recuperate to treat myself like a guest is very strange the, you know if that, if that kind of makes sense it's like that's been one of the most recent things i've i've been trying to teach myself i've been trying to learn it's like how it, it's almost how do you love yourself but physically right how do you physically show that that love to yourself because internally yeah. my dialogue's changed a lot internally my dialogue used to be i don't matter i'm not good enough and loads of things that came with that now the dialogue is i'm great i'm free and all kinds of other f- affirming kind of things but i always physically act that way <laughs> you know what i mean so it's a case of how do i learn to do that yeah, I would infer that with your grasp of mindset, you mm. can you can adopt this this lightness train, mm. you know, and just just kind of shifting the affirmations a little more that direction of of you know I want to laugh at life, I want to be sure lighter, I want to be less serious, and sure, I I you know I totally believe that you as somebody who has 
kind of bought into the power of mindset can mm. can use that to your advantage. And the other thing with work, I think that's a great one and it's relatable to anybody who's listening or anyone who is a hard worker is I think that's something innate in people who have that drive. You know, the reason that you have the confidence to be an entrepreneur is because you know you have the work ethic and you know that you're going to do whatever it takes to get to your goals. So, you know, setting boundaries with yourself and setting, like you said, mm. that 60 hour boundary. So maybe it's 50, dude. Maybe it's 55. Maybe it's 50. And, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. One time. You know, I, 60 I, is, mm. if you're tapped out at 60, then you're, you know, kind of in the red of exertion. Or if you were an engine, your RPMs are kind of maxed out. So maybe it's less than that. And that's actually going to be where you're going to be most productive sure. and happiest. Sure. I've heard stories of people who, um, they, they, you know, like they worked, you know, really crazy corporate jobs or whatever, where they were working stupid hours a week and whatever. And then it suddenly had a big effect on them. And they're like, I have to go to the doctor. This isn't working. And the doctor says, my prescription is for you to, to not work more than 40 hours a week. And they're like, what? What the fuck? <laughs> That's impossible. <laughs> um, but then because you set yourself that limit, you find a way to be productive within that time, which I find really interesting because I still don't know how I would do that. Um, without being a bit more financially successful. Again, earlier in my career, so I don't mind that I'm not, but it's like, what is your situation? What is your balance? That's what I find so interesting. I totally agree with what you've just said. I feel like the only thing I'd add to that is to look at your cir current circumstance, right? And getting more into, into the mental health element of some of the stuff that I end up talking about when I go on, on shows like this and stuff is mental health, especially for young leaders, which is the audience I face, I do feel like this is really, really, it, it might even be more relevant specifically for younger men. I'm sure talking, uh, uh, being, being a, a podcast focused on advice for, for other men. Um, you've had this statistic come up before the, the concept or the fact that male suicide rates are so high and it's one of the biggest killers. In fact, I can't remember the statistic now, but it's one of the biggest killers of men in, at least I think it's in the UK and US, is suicide, right? Which is insane. It's this idea that like, it is okay. So whatever it is, it is okay. I feel like what I've noticed recently is the amount of pressure from all directions. And, um, because of the life I've had growing up, the life I had growing up, there was a lot of loss. I don't have much family. I experienced some difficult traumas and various different issues. Um, things like rough sleeping. So not having anywhere to go for the night. Um, because in, in America, as you know, we don't really get support with shit like that. Whereas here in the UK, if someone's really, if family's really struggling, especially if they've got a child, they'll get some support from the government to at least be able to survive and keep the roof over their heads. No more normally, obviously people fall through the cracks, unfortunately, but it was like, it was very, very difficult for us in LA. There was always anxiety. There was always stress. There was always worry. There was anger coming from family. And so what that meant is that growing up, that pressure was all that I knew, if that makes sense. So I think what I'm getting at is it did, I didn't feel like it was okay when I felt a certain type of way. If I felt negative in a way or whatever, it didn't feel okay. If I wasn't achieving what I wanted to in my work, it wasn't okay. It, it, it would, whatever it was, it wasn't okay. It wasn't okay. It wasn't okay. That's what it always felt like. And the, the, and, that, and that's why it breaks my heart to see that so many people like myself, whether it's young people, leaders who might be young leaders or not, um, not young, they're, they're, they're leaders who are older or more experienced as well. And, and a lot of people even losing their lives over it, a lot of it breaking down to the fact that it just doesn't feel like it's okay. If you've got all these pressures coming in from all these different areas and it just doesn't feel okay, then those pressures eventually, how do you deal with them? Right? How do you deal with something that isn't okay? But yeah. Shifting the idea of what is okay and what isn't. I wonder how much that helps. By my experience, it helps a lot to, to be able to Agreed. understand what, what is okay and what isn't. And a lot of the time, if something sure. we think isn't okay, it's still okay. Does that kind of make any sense? Yeah, absolutely, man. I've got 
you know, something going on in my personal life that I've been seeking a lot of advice on for, mm. you know, from family and friends. And I mean, also the whole concept of seeking advice is kind of problematic because oftentimes the person you're seeking advice from just relays to you their own experiences, yeah, which can be helpful, but it's not the person asking the questions yeah. life. So that's a different conversation, but yeah, a lot of the feedback I've been giving on this thing I've been seeking advice on has been, it's okay. Mm. You know, and these feelings you're feeling are normal and these yeah. feelings are okay. And you're not a bad person for having these thoughts and you're not doomed for going down this line of questioning. Sure. So I completely agree with you, man. And that, that message that it's going to be okay and you are okay. And you know, you are loved is massive. And yeah, mm. suicide is extremely common. Yeah. It's not acknowledged. You know, there are a lot of people out there who have thought about attempting, mm. or have attempted, and it's not really talked about in our in our culture, and that's something that needs to change. So I'm happy yeah. you brought it up. You know, my short-term motivations for the podcast kind of were stemmed by the conversation around injustices in, in our country, but longer term, kind of my life experiences and, and things that influenced me were come, came from losing friends to suicide okay, and having very close friends attempt when we were quite young. And mm. that was a very formative experience for me and kind of opening my eyes to the fact that this happens and the people struggle. And the, the analogy is that when someone's in crisis, you know, they can only see life as if it was through a straw. Yeah. You know, they can only see what's in that straw and they can't open up, you know, the whole perspective. So yeah, for anyone who is listening, you know, you're not alone and exactly. it is okay. Whatever you're feeling is okay. And there are resources available to help you. Yeah. A hundred percent. I really resonate with that man because, um, I've, I've had friends in that, in that same position. And I've also been that person in that position, um, a number of times. And it's like, it just, it breaks my heart that we feel like it can't be okay. And the thing is, I understand why we think that in the sense that like two plus two equals four, right? So it makes sense that it's the case, but it shouldn't be the case. And it's one of those things where we do have a bit more control, but I, I understand what you mean. A lot of the times I've had to, t I've had to tell my friends, some of my friends off for this even, and, um, people I've worked with even as well. It's like our, the, the thing people will usually do is we'll give advice, but often advice isn't what we want is, isn't what we want when we are talking to people about something. What we want is just to talk about it. Listening is different from giving advice. If someone asks me for, for my advice, sometimes I'll go, do you want my advice or do you want me to listen? Because I'll be a great listener, but my advice might be totally fucking irrelevant for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and, and, yeah, and that's the sure. thing. I, if I had to give one tip to anyone listening who kind of is along the, 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 the same lines as we are in terms of our thinking is like, learn to listen. Something, uh, if you ever get into, into like coaching or maybe you are into, into something like coaching, something you learn is that most of us go through our whole lives never feeling listened to, period, by anybody. Um, and actually, even as an entrepreneur, there's a, a big part of it is listening, listening to customers, listening to team members, really learning to listen. It's a skill that is so hilariously, uh, undertaught and underappreciated in our society. I think it's almost comedic. Yeah. It's like, you know, when you're in school, it's like, why aren't you listening? If someone's, I don't know, talking in class or whatever, it's like the teacher will, will tell you off and they'll be like, why aren't you listening? Blah, 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 blah. And actually when they say, why aren't you listening? They don't mean, why aren't you listening? They mean, why aren't you doing what I want you to do? Why aren't you staying quiet? So listening means staying quiet. Listening means not interrupting uh, listening means doing a certain thing or whatever, but it doesn't, we've never actually been taught to listen. Listening means hearing and not interrupting for us. I feel like, especially when we're growing up, but it doesn't actually necessarily mean listening. So a lot of us don't know how to listen. And therefore a lot of us don't feel like we have been listened to sometimes ever. And yeah, I mean, I think things yes. like therapy are fantastic uh, if that's what you need. But a lot of the time I feel like when we go to therapy, we don't, necessarily need therapy we just need someone to listen so building your own skill of being able to listen to others i think can be so powerful for transforming the lives around you personally and i try my best to work on sure. my own and, abilities and, to do that too yeah and seeing people and mm. just to clarify i think 
we're not saying when we say it's gonna it's okay like we're not minimizing people's yeah crisis like not at all exactly it's just it's just a bit of a mindset shift of this is the human condition and this is Mm. part of the deal unfortunately or fortunately if you can flip your mindset on it but yeah I, i agree man people that's a very i think good concept to leave it on before we switch to the the three things game sure about how just acknowledging that the incentive structures of our oftentimes our family structures our jobs our schools our teams Mm. are not really built around the individual being seen and heard it's more about for the family example the family unit being functional Mm. and 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 families will almost do anything anything to make sure the family unit is functioning Sure. At the expense of the individual who maybe doesn't want to fit this mold of this family. Sure. And doesn't see eye to eye with the values that have permeated the the social structure of the family. Mm. And, you know, it's not incentivized for people to speak up and, and and a lot of people don't know how to how to give that true listening to other people. So I think that's a Yeah, man. That's a good point, man. It's it's but I know we have five minutes. Yeah, let's so jump gonna, let's jump to it. I'm interested move, in this game. The, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fun. So uh, what month is your birthday in? July. Your birthday is sooner than mine, so you're gonna go first. And what so it's a question, you'll get a question mm-hmm. that you answer. I have a different question that I answer. Okay. And I this is your question, man. I think it's gonna be a very good one for you. Okay. What are three things your childhood taught you? Wow, that's a fantastic relevant question. <laughs> um three things my childhood taught me. Number one, I would say is don't let your, your parents' beliefs or guardians or whatever influences, but for most of us, it'll inevitably be our parents. Don't let your parents' beliefs in what is possible for you become your belief in what is possible for you. Create your own belief for what is possible for you. Even if they believe fantastic things were possible for you, it might be that what those fantastic things were are different. Number two, Ooh, number two is how do I phrase this? Number two is probably around trauma. My childhood taught me to be afraid of things that are going to hurt you. My childhood taught me that uh, certain ways of acting or being or thinking are not okay. Um, things like that. And then those become became either traumatic experiences or really deep-rooted beliefs. And so the takeaway for me now in my life is don't let those childhood experiences define you. You can learn to rise above whatever things end up being a little bit traumatic for you or causing some kind of habit as a, as an adult. And a number three, a number three is really, really hard. I think number three would be much more simple. I want to, I want to keep number three more fun uh, and more light. Um, and those first two are a bit heavy. Laughing is fantastic. <laughs> right you know you know when you're just being and you know what even create think i in fact i'm going to add to that creativity is fantastic i remember being a kid and just you know a little kid running around with my friends pretending like we were in narnia or whatever just enjoying life enjoying make believe interesting fun scenarios um like video games in our heads basically have that creativity that makes you laugh that makes you excited that makes you interesting that stimulates your brain that is okay like as adults we're like no let's be more serious which we talked about earlier actually my childhood taught me life can be fantastic if you if you let that more creative more creative and fun side out life will feel amazing hell yeah <laughs> go for it cool nice man thank you for sure you sharing here's my question Another relevant question. What are three things I have learned about listening? Yeah, number one, I really enjoy listening. I, I enjoy it. My recent guest, Nico, had a good line from his dad, which is uh, you have two ears and one mouth. So I try to follow that because I think you can learn things quite quite quickly with, with active listening. And it also, like we talked about, lets people, gives people their humanity and gives them the the power essentially of you know what, someone's listening to me and the things I'm saying, the things I'm thinking and feeling matter. And this person, you know, cares enough to listen. Yeah. And that, that's that's very powerful. Nice. Number two, I would say is that, you know, to, to actively listen takes energy and it takes mm. empathy and takes emotional bandwidth. So yeah. knowing when to say, hey, I'm, I'm tapped out right now. Yeah. Like, I, I can't. I can't be here. I can't I can't meet you where you need to be met right now. 
can we can we circle back around and, yeah. and uh, this time tomorrow? Oh my god, that's that so true. I feel that so much so, <laughs> I, because it feels strange to not say that, but sometimes you gotta, man. I feel that for sure. So, you know, and, and it's it's a respect thing for the other person too. Like if yeah. they really need to talk, and you know, I don't know, I don't have the the energy. You know, that's a it's better to be honest about that. Yeah, I would say. yeah. And number three, man, I think that our interpersonal relationships on a micro level in our society you know our, our global world countries interacting with each other would be much more productive and less conflict oriented if, if people could listen to each other so completely agree man completely yeah awesome dude seven thank you so much for for hopping on the pod and sharing your your thoughts and your wisdom i really enjoyed our conversation yeah thank you so much for having me thomas i enjoyed it 